words about that tough period, what was going on? I think he realized after you go from playing the student prince, you know, for the door, a dollar per head who come in, and there's no salary, I don't even know if they had free beer. They had a dollar for every person they got to walk through the doors. We got Vinny Lopez out there. <laughs> he was in that band. He could tell us about that a little bit. Am I right, Vinny? Yeah, free beer. Free beer? Oh, you did get the free beer. Oh, let me see. Now, there you go. That's all right. And the, you guys weren't drawing crowds then, at December of, of, uh, 70, of 70, right? We, we played there for another one. Exactly. Five, six people would come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, but still, at that point, you know, he was, he was driving toward that sort of R&B sound, that soul sound. And I think when he got to the 90s, and he felt like he had sort of taken these guys from that, that five or six people at the Student Prince, all the way to endless nights at the biggest stadiums in the world and essentially become the world's biggest rock and roll star, without a doubt. The only rivals in the pop world were Madonna and Michael Jackson, and they clearly were not rock and roll stars. But Bruce became kind of the face of America, the anti-Reagan face, all across the world. What do you do after that? Max Weinberg talks about basically bursting into tears after the last show at Memorial Coliseum. He turned to his wife and said, you know, this is it. This is the end. And they played that kind of half-hearted Tunnel of Love tour, sort of almost, you know, purposely sh shunted to the side. Bruce knew that he had to take a break from the band. The way that he phrased it, though, was more final than that, more final than he meant it to be, where he essentially said, we're done, and I'm going to work with other people. And he did, and he, he, you know, I think he gave it the old college try. He tried to make an R&B record. Mm -hmm. It turned into like a little, probably more smooth and more sort of, you know, digitally perfect than he needed it to be. Very quickly, I think, understood viscerally that that was wrong, and, and then at the same, you know, in, within two, three weeks, made uh, Lucky Town, which was the opposite direction, a raw, homemade rock and roll record. And then spent this time, you know, and then spent all of 1994 trying to make kind of what's essentially a trip hop album. Uh, you know, electronica. And a lot of those songs are beautiful. He made this whole record, and I think he still believes in that music, but he did not believe at that time that it was the right time to spring it on his audience. And that, once he finished essentially making 95% of that record, trashed it and did the E Street Band reunion in 95, which was not happy for anybody. Not in the band, certainly not for Bruce. But they went through the motions, and, uh, you know, and then he made the, the Tom Joad record, and uh, which was essentially a, a, a graduate student's dissertation set to set to quiet music. From it's the only rock and roll record that comes with a uh, uh, you know with with prerequisite reading on the liner notes. Um, and then I think he, he he came to realize, and I think for sort of slowly and painfully, that the heart of what he was trying to do was in some way symbolized by the community of the Street Band around him. At which point, you know, I think that reunion tour in 99, which he kind of had to be dragged to by Landau, though, you know, he had his, you know, he, I think he sort of understood on one level but was frightened about taking a step backward and being made irrelevant by his, you know, finally when that really got into gear, and I think he really felt the magic of that, that you know, that community sinking into him, he gained confidence he began to write songs more effortlessly that sounded like him. And when they got through that tour, you know, he was working on that record with Joe Krushecki. Mm -hmm. Joe was co-writing some music with him. And, uh, you know, but then 9-11. At which point, the call for somebody like Bruce, somebody who seemed to symbolize a very, you know, and I think he understands this very consciously, that he symbolizes something kind of purely everyday American to people something kind of transcendent, as, you know, as transcendent as poetry, but as ordinary as a guy eating a slice at Federici's. 